So I'm just going to quickly redraw the two configurations. This is the reference. This is the current. Okay. And sometimes you'll hear people say, or you'll see in literature, you know, notice I specifically use the word configuration, not frame. But sometimes you'll see and hear that reference frame, current frame. Okay. The problem is there's really just one frame, there's one sort of observer frame. Right? These are configurations of the body. And so, if, with respect to that frame, if we have a point X, and we're going to use capital letters for the reference configuration. So that was consistent with you know, what I previously presented. So in the reference configuration, we have a point capital X. And the body's going to undergo some deformation. And that same point X is going to be in a new spot, right? And we're going to call that little x. So capital letters, reference configuration, lowercase letters, current configuration, right? And this point, of course, can be described with a vector with respect to some frame. as can this one, and uh, that's not a very straight line. This is a vector. Right. So little x can be described with that vector. And it should be clear that the difference between them, right, we deformed the body is a vector that we'll call the displacement u. Okay. So with, with this drawing, it should be clear that little x, I also need to be judicious about the use of my vector signs, right? So little x in the current configuration can also be written as big X where it was plus u, right? So I can describe little x where the point is in the current configuration from where it's been in the deformation. Or the, I'm sorry, the displacement, u. Okay. So with this, and, and just to be clear, I'm going to be painfully explicit for a minute. Just to be clear, when I write a vector, big X, right, what I'm talking about is it's a vector, right? So it's x1, and if you're, you know, I'm going to do this a couple of ways. From undergraduate statics, you might have said i hat, right? x2, j hat, plus x3, k hat, right? So these are unit vectors in the reference frame, right? That define the reference frame, the basis frame, okay? Now, in this class, we're always going to use Cartesian, but just know that in general, that's not the case. And so, because in general it's not the case, and also for a convenience of notation, we also might write this as x1, e1, plus x2, e2, plus x3, e3. Right? And the reason for this, again, is that you know these e's, I mean, has, has anyone seen this kind of notation before, where you sort of are we're just replacing i, j, and k with e1, two, e1, two, u, right? And it could be, we do this because it, if all we were ever concerned with was a Cartesian frame, then we, we could just use i, j, and k. But we may, and if you take it like a continuum mechanics course or something, a more advanced course than a theoretical continuum mechanics, your coordinate bases could be cylindrical or polar. And in that case, the bases themselves are actually functions, right? So they change. And that's why this distinction is important. But another thing it allows us to do is to write the notation a little more compactly. Right? So this is a vector. We could also write this vector as, well, as the sum as i goes to 1 to 3, x i e i. Right? And in this class, we're going to take that even a step further. We're going to introduce something that may be new to you guys, uh, called initial notation, or Einstein initial notation. And all it is is that the summation is applied.
implied when there's a repeated index, right? So if I one more time write this as x equal xi p hat i, the summation is implied. Right? So any time in any one term in a monomial or any one term you see a repeated index, that means there's a summation sign. So these two things are identical. Right? So Einstein introduced this notation for compactness because we'll write some really long equations later on and you know if we had to carry those summation signs all everywhere it would get pretty nasty right but the nice thing to remember is we're always dealing with cartesian coordinates so the sum is always from 1 to 3 right at most in two dimensions you might be 1 to 2 and then in one dimension you don't you don't need it right so this is important is when you see this in the repeated indices just know that it implies a summation Okay, so again, to go back to our drawing, it should be clear that in fact our vector little x is a function, a vector function of the vector big X and possibly time. Okay, and again, I want to be painfully explicit just so that I make sure you, you understand the concept here. What I mean, what this equation means, right? And by the way, I will, and this is common in continuum mechanics setting in the literature and otherwise, just conveniently switch between initial notation like this and vector notation whenever it's convenient. Uh, I'll try to use the vector notation when, when I can, to the, to, especially when we get into matrices and other things. It's, just, it's linear algebra at that point. But occasionally, you can't do that, and, and so I'll just switch between initial notation and vector notation. All right. So anyway, when I when I write this equation, what I mean is that the x1 component, the first component of little x, is a function of the x1, you know, the, the first component of big X, the direction cosine x2, x3, time. OK. So since I wrote it out so explicitly now, what we want to do <coughs> is let's investigate a small change in x, actually a small change in little x. This change is going to be carried out instantaneously in time. But if we do that, and it just follows from it follows from th these equations here and the chain rule, right? Then we have px1 is equal to partial x1 partial x1 px1 plus <coughs> partial x2 px2 px2 plus partial x3 px3. Ah, I messed that up. This is x1, right? Didn't, didn't imply the chain rule properly. OK. Likewise, and I know I'm being sort of painfully explicit here, but likewise for spatial change in x2, we have 
Okay. Now, how many of you have had a linear algebra class? Maybe half the class. Well, even if you haven't, <coughs> you know, you should you should recognize this. And I'm sure you in, in, you've seen matrix you matrix equations before, right? Well, you can see that this very much looks like a matrix equation. So just to write it out, yes? With time? Uh, yeah, it was subtle, but I said in an instant of time. So basically holding time constant, investigate. The, so there's no change in time as we investigate this change in, in spatial. So, okay, but good observation. So, if I write this as a matrix equation, then we have and I think I'll save you the Explicit writing out of all the terms, right? Everybody okay with that? Right. Okay, we have this guy. And so this is our matrix equation. And what this thing is called is called a deformation gradient. And the common notation is F. Right. So there's one good thing about mechanics is for the most part, when you go to the literature, everyone uses a very similar notation. And that's where I get that big X, little X, and you know, F, the deformation gradient is almost always called F. So it makes it easy to read papers because you go, you pick up the paper, you don't sort of need to look at the notation, you kind of know what it means, right? So so this is the deformation gradient, and if we write it as, so now back into vector form, we have this, right? And in, just to be clear, in initial notation, we might write it like this. Now, F is not a is not a vector, right? It's a, it's a matrix, or more specifically, it's a second order tensor. So the summation is carried out over J. Right? So the components, the components of D big X, are summed over J. So basically, this is just a matrix vector o operation, right? And then I's, the I's are the free indices. They represent the equation number. So this, we're going to sum over J for every I equation. And I and J go from 1 to 3. Okay? So I guess just to be clear, I could say for I, 1, 2, 3. Right? And of course, in this class, we're going to drop that summation. So we're going to write it like this. F, I, J, D, X, J. Right? Again, summation is applied over J. So sum over j for every i equation. That's how you do that. All right. Now, if you sort of, if you have linear algebra, you might recognize this. Now, remember d big X. That's a vector in d. In what configuration? Big X. Reference. Right. So d X is a it's a little infinitesimal vector in the reference configuration. D little x is a little infinitesimal vector in the current configuration. And the deformation gradient takes one to the other. It's the mapping between them, right? So it's, it's a linear map that takes D big X into D little x. Right? And so mathematically, you'd call this a two-point tensor because it doesn't live in either frame. It lives in between them in two points. Right? And it takes vectors in the reference configuration into their images in the deformed configuration.
So it's really one of the most, the deformation gradient is really one of the most fundamental things in continuum mechanics. All right? So you also might notice that this guy here, this matrix, we could write the matrix alone in additional notation. Right? We could say that this Fij is equal to partial Xi partial xj. So that's another way you'd write the deformation gradient. And sometimes I'm a little bit bothered by this notation because you have to recall that x, I need my vectors there, is a function of big X, right? Because if you don't do that, then it doesn't seem to make sense. It's like you're taking the partial derivative of a dependent variable with a dependent variable, right? Or an independent variable with an independent variable. So just remember that little x is a function of big X, and that's why this kind of thing makes sense, right? And also recall that we wrote, you know, if we go back to our diagram, we wrote that little x, and remember, so reference deformed Big X, little x, and the vector in between them is displacement, u, right? So we could write little x as x just through vector algebra, right? Big X plus u, right? And now if we take the partial, if we take the partial derivative with respect to the components of x of this equation, right? And we have partial xi, partial xj equals to partial xi partial xj plus partial u, well, sorry, ui. Partial xj. Well, what's this? this term? Looks like this, right? Right? Same thing. So that's F. Right? Now this Well, I'm writing them, again, I'm switching, okay, if that helps, I'll write Fij. I'm, I was switching kind of from vector to tensor notation, but um, we'll write it both ways, right? So Fij, what, this, this guy, right? Well, it's one when, it's one when i equals to j, right? It's zero otherwise. Because it, the partial of x1, so if we wrote out the components, right? partial x1, partial x1, well, that's 1, right? But partial x1, partial x2 is equal to 0, and so on, right? So it's only when i equals a j, and that's a something special we call the Kronecker delta function, right? Okay. In this, we don't, we don't change the way we write it. It's, it's just that. Right? <coughs> So that's another definition or another way of coming up with F. If you know the displacements, you can take this thing is called a displacement gradient. So this is called a displacement gradient. You add U with respect to X. Right? This, right, is Again, this is something called the Kronecker delta function. So just know it's really easy. It's when it's equal to 1 when i is equal to j, and it's equal to 0 otherwise right, when i is not equal to j. And, you know, in vector, I mean, in, in tensor or matrix notation, then we could just write this whole equation f i plus grad 
So 